Hello, this is Ted Dangelmeyer, and uh, thank you for joining us for one of our complimentary webinars. And uh, today we have uh, Terry Welsher lined up to uh, give us some of his uh, recent work and thinking on electrical overstress. As you know, it's an area that's not well defined, and uh, we're learning as we go. But uh, Terry's uh, got some interesting information for you, and I'm, I'm going to uh, turn it over to him. But just before I do that, if you want to ask questions, there are you can type in your questions um, into the uh, dialog box, or you can raise your hand if you want to ask it verbally. Right now, everybody's muted. Um, but if I see your hand raised, I'll um, activate your your audio communication. So with that, um, Terry, take it away. Thank you, Ted. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. If you are not uh, getting my voice through loud and clear, please let us know. Uh, yeah, so today's topic is rethinking electrical overstress, and I want to just uh, give a proper acknowledgments. Um, <clears throat> Ted said this was uh, my thinking. Actually, um, I had a part of it, but really uh, much of the material here was the result of a two- or three-year project by the uh, uh, Industry Council on ESD Targets who expanded their charter to look at electrical overstress because of its prevalence in the industry as a cause of failure of devices. So many of the slides actually come from a white paper, white paper for uh, understanding EOS, uh, which is available on the ESDA website. Uh, uh, so if you want to know more detail about all this, you could go look there. Uh, that's about two-thirds of the material that I, I'm be showing today. Uh, the the rest is from a tutorial that I give in the uh, ESDA every year on this topic, uh, and some slides uh, on uh, manufacturing uh, issues uh, that are part of a ongoing working group creating a technical report on mitigating EOS in manufacturing. So uh, we're developing a lot of new information in the standards world on this topic. And my main mission today really is to introduce you to uh, the thought process that went into uh, building a structure for understanding electrical overstress. And it meant rethinking definitions and terms. And so we'll spend some time doing that. And hopefully, uh, uh, this will be useful to you in future encounters where you may uh, find you have the potential for failures that occur due to electrical stresses and how to talk about them and handle the information. Uh, so Ted, I'm having trouble changing. We should have tried that before we started. Yeah, I would think you should be able to just forward the slide set. Click on the slide and. Yeah, this, it, may, it may be my problem. Hang on a second. The screen's frozen. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Okay. Well, you have a copy. How bringing up your copy and we'll do it that way? OK. That, that should help independent of what my screen's experiencing. Bear with us, folks. Sorry. Now, let me go back here. Now, let's see, wait a minute, where's that guy? What's going on? OK, I'm taking control again. OK. I feel much more comfortable this way. Yeah, I know you do. I, th I think somehow you were... <laughs> it's cool. Giving you control always takes me a little yeah, nervous. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, you want to put that in presentation mode and then we'll... Yeah, there we go. Let's okay, uh, all right. This... All okay, right. so let's go, let's go to the second slide. 
So it's got a little animation in it. You want to just click through a couple of times. So we're going to do a little bit of an inter introduction and motivation of why we're talking about this. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, models uh, for EOS. Not a great deal, but just enough to maybe to make you literate in some of the terms you may hear when people talk about electrical overstress damage. Uh, we will spend some time on terminology, which can be a dry subject, but I hope you'll see that um, it's important that we understand uh, the terms we're talking about, especially when suppliers and users find themselves discussing what the cause of a failure was and uh, whose uh, side of the corporate boundary uh, the cause may lie. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about categorizing sources of electro stress, or really the proper term would be root causes. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about mitigation. Uh, in particular, mitigation in the factory. Okay, Ted? And we will, um, time permitting, have questions and discussion. So uh, this slide is um, sort of speaking somewhat in the old uh, terminology for electrical overstress. So we can talk about um, different, different terms that may be related to electrical overstress, such as ESD. Uh, ESD is one type of electrical stress, and one thing we know about it over the last 30 years is that it has received a lot of attention. Uh, there's been a lot of work on designing devices so that they have a certain level of robustness. Robustness. We can measure that robustness using standard test methods, and we have uh, well proven factory controls that have been codified into standards such as S2020 or JEDEC 625 and a few others so that although they're not perfect and they certainly see challenges having to do with the continuing miniaturization and uh, increase in speed of devices, we have a system that's pretty well working to keep failures low. But certainly ESD is not the only kind of electrical stress. There are many, many other stresses that can come to, into a device, particularly when it's being connected to sources of voltage or current or power uh, during manufacturing test, during system test, and then during use in the field. And since there are so many other uh, electrical stresses, uh, there's no coherent design to take care of all of them. And sometimes you'll hear people talk, people talk about, well, we put in protection for ESD, why don't we just put in protection for EOS as if it was just another stress? But that in fact is not the case. It is not just another stress. Uh, it actually is a phenomenon that occurs due to a wide variety of root causes. And we'll talk about that a little bit. We have no analogous uh, standard industry test like human body model and charge device model. And we have no broadly applicable requirements that we could put into data sheets other than the uh, ex absolute maximum ratings that normally appear in data sheets. And part of what we talk about today will be interpreting those absolute maximum ratings in a way that is related to electrical overstress. Okay, let's go to the next slide. While I'm doing that, uh, we did get one question uh, regarding okay. the availability of this webinar afterwards. It will be uh, posted on our website uh, about a week from now. And it okay. also will be complimentary there. Okay. So one of the things m m uh, some of you may see often is a breakdown of failures in an organization or in a, in a, in a factory. Uh, due to various causes, and you'll see bar charts like this. And uh, often uh, there's a category called EOS, and things get put into this category in a wide variety of ways, many of them which are not particularly reliable. But basically when, a, when you have a device that has a um, physical damage which uh, is extensive, uh, the failure analysis organization will tell you, well, that's probably EOS. Now, of course, this doesn't really tell you very much. And in fact, even, even when they tell you it's EOS, um, it could still be ESD. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In fact, quite often it could be ESD. It'd be, uh, the root cause could be ESD. 
Uh, the other uh, bars here are, uh, you know, quite common. You know, no trouble found is, um, you know, quite common. A lot of the devices are returned. You don't see any evidence of failure, and they function fine. Uh, you have defects that come into the factory from uh, the fab. Uh, there can be failures in assembly and test uh, that are not electrical failures um, that also get countered. But nonetheless, you know, the perception is, and it's probably a good one, is that we have a lot of failures that occur in the factory and in the field, which are due to an unknown electrical stress that are a big opportunity for improvement. The problem is we haven't been able to systematically attack it. Okay, next slide. Uh, here's another breakdown. Uh, this is from the automotive industry, uh, courtesy of Bosch. And uh, their experience uh, gets broken down this way, where 97% of the failures that they see are electrical overstress or are categorized as electrical overstress. 3% they say are definitely identifiable as ESD. Uh, but again, the assignments aren't uh, really uh, that well founded, and so we don't really know what the breakdown is. But clearly, there's a lot of failure that's occurring that we don't understand root cause. Next slide, please. Uh, the costs of ESD uh, have been uh, pretty constant over the last 30, 40 years, uh, about uh, in terms of proportion, about 25 to 35 percent of failures tend to fit into this category. In some industries, it's higher. It's definitely a high burden for the semiconductor and board assembly uh, operations. Uh, this failure fraction has remained about the same for many, many years. And uh, the root causes are just notoriously uh, difficult to pinpoint. And often um, it's not systematic, not a systematic failure, and the root cause is hard to find. Next slide, please. So uh, sometimes you hear people talk about what's the difference between EOS and ESD, and this is where we start to get a little bit into the language. So ESD is this uh, very short voltage or current pulse that's injected into an external object. And we know that ESD has occurred often because we've done it in a test, or uh, we can relate back to an automatic handling machine or wrist straps going out of control, something of this sort. And so ESD as a root cause is, is well known, and we know what the uh, stressor pulses are like uh, to the point where we actually can do design and we can have test methods. Uh, then what you'll hear people talk about then is, is EOS, and they call EOS a stress. They call, so it's a voltage or current pulse, could be of, of almost any length. Uh, it's typically application dependent. Uh, there'll be some kind of thermal damage which produces these large, uh, relatively large failures that we see when we do failure analysis. And uh, you could have mild failures, you know, leakage, something of this sort, just like you would with uh, an ESD root cause. Uh, but sometimes you can just, you know, completely melt the device, you know, depending on, on, on what the root cause is. Okay, but this, this, this definition or description of EOS is changing, and that's why I've put that uh, overlay there. Next slide, please. And uh, you know, one of the main uh, takeaways from all of this is that the physical failure doesn't necessarily tell you uh, what is going on. And uh, the you know, here we have something that's you know possibly an EOS, uh, yet the on the left, yet and uh, yet the, the physical failures aren't that dramatic. Um, they aren't typically, uh, you know, much more dramatic than the ESD, even though the current that was flowing at the time of these failures is quite different. Uh, the one on the left, in fact, is, an, is a, has a root cause which is not ESD, which is the proper way to say this, um, but we can't tell from the physical failure mode. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, you'll often hear about something called the Wunsch-Bell plot. Uh, so that's just in here. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but in general, the, the size of a failure uh, has to do with the amount of time that the stress is applied. 
but this is not always the case. If you look at the Wunsch Bell plot, it gives you that uh, idea. Uh, for the cases later on that we talk about where an ESD root cause is identified um, but produces something that looks like an EOS, it's because in that case uh, the uh, charge available uh, was so much higher, not that the pulse was necessarily longer. Uh, so the adiabatic regime is where you, the failure occurs so quickly that no heat flows. So that is typical of charge device model ESD failures where you get a pinpoint failure site uh, on a gate oxide. And then the intermediate and steady state ranges are where uh, the pulse uh, lasts long enough that uh, the heat in uh, competes with the heat out because there's a significant diffusion in the device. Uh, we won't go into this uh, uh, much further, but uh, again, part of the part of the goal of this uh, webinar is to give you terminology that you'll hear in the EOS, ESD EOS um, field. Next slide, please. So here's some key definitions. I've been trying to be careful with my language, but I have to tell you that. Um, Sometimes I slip and go back to the old ways of talking th about things. Uh, so if you catch me, let me know. That'd be great. Uh, so the uh, some terms are uh, so electrical stress uh, is any electrical current, voltage, or power that is imposed on a device. It could even include the operating uh, voltage and current. And so it's an electrical stress without the over in it because. Uh, we don't know if something is an overstress unless we know something about the ability of the device to withstand the stress. And so that's where this second term comes in, which is the absolute maximum rating. And typically these are values that are included in device data sheets or other device documentation that will tell you about specific absolute limiting values for handling and applying the use of devices. And we'll talk a little bit more how that relates to other uh, limits on devices in, uh, shortly. The AMR is designed by the uh, manufacturer. And um, here's a little bit more information about it. So the user needs to know uh, what is the safe usage of this device. So the supplier does quite a bit of work to understand what is the limit of the, on the use of the device. And uh, then uh, once the uh, user of the device gets this information, they, it's incumbent upon them to stay within those boundaries, in fact, well within the boundaries. And uh, the main idea here is that if you, if you exceed the AMR, you have an electrical overstress. If you have, an, if you have a failure where the, uh, you did not, in fact, exceed the AMR, then that is a device, that's a defective device. Uh, so that's a subtle distinction that's being made now in the, in the terminology. Next slide. Uh, you can talk about combinations of AMRs and define a safe operating area. So this is just a, look, a way of looking at several electrical stresses at the same time. And it's actually a typical way of presenting uh, the usable area of a device. If we go to the next slide. Uh, so on the left, you'll see a, uh, a current limit and a voltage limit. And there's also a independent power limit that will give you what we would call a safe operating area. The chart on the right uh, kind of uses the old uh, terminology. So I really should put an X over that to make the point. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to talk about an EOS area and an ESD area. Uh, the correct way to talk about this is the whole area is EOS. In the short time to failure, uh, power to failure area, um, the ESD root cause is more likely. Um, there's not a dividing point between the two, as is, as is seen here, that you'll find in many, many textbooks and on many, many failure analysis sites. And next slide, please. Uh, here's an example of an actual safe operating area out of a device data sheet. 
And here there's actually uh, four uh, uh, AMRs that are including the current, a voltage, a power, and a second breakdown limit. Okay, next slide. So how should we talk about these terms? So electrical overstress is actually an amount of stress. It means that the stress that occurred exceeds some characteristic of the device uh, as a manufactured structure. Uh, so it's a quantity of stress. ESD is a kind of stress or a root cause. So this is discharging of, C, of a C, discharging of a capacitor is it's going on somewhere. Either the, either the device is the capacitor or some uh, other object at a different voltage is the is the source. Uh, so this isn't an amount, it's a quality or a kind of stress. So it doesn't make sense to say was the failure EOS or ESD. They are not alternatives to each other and in fact ESD can be a cause of electrical overstress damage. Next slide please. Uh, Terry, we had a question regarding slide 13. Okay. And question is what is the difference between uh, breakdown sites versus interconnects? Could you go back to the slide? I'm not connecting with that question. Oh, so uh, a voltage stress can cause um, a high electric field at some point in an object and so the driving force becomes that field, whereas a current tends to can flow in a metal line, for instance, and cause heating. Um, so that's that's what we're talking about there. So you know, one is exceeding a breakdown limit, and having to do with an electric field, which is caused by a voltage, and uh, a current flowing, where the the, um, the the degradation of the device has to do with joule heating, just the, the material. Uh, heating up above some limit. Okay. All right, we can go on to 16. So here is the definition of electrical overstress that's in uh, white paper four that I mentioned before. An electrical uh, device suffers electrical overstress when a maximum limit for either a voltage across the current through or the power dissipated in the device is exceeded and causes an immediate damage or malfunction or latent damage resulting in an unpredictable reduction in its lifetime. Uh, that definition took about three years to craft. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was not an easy discussion um, to sort of come up with something that clearly stated the principle that I've been uh, saying here all along, has, which has to do with the connection between the overstress and exceeding a device specification limit. Okay, uh, next slide please. So, uh, this, this, a few comments about the relationship between the AMR. So the device suffers an EOS when the maximum limit for each of these voltage, current, or power possibilities are exceeded. This this is the term that we use and it's different from the operating limit for instance and we'll show you a chart with that uh, shortly. Uh, so the AMR is determined by the supplier and uh, the AMR is intended to be um, acknowledged by the system designer uh, but we know that um, sometimes that does not happen um, for a wide variety of reasons and this is often a root cause of failures. Uh, the IC supplier in defining this AMR has to deal with their own process variations and the dependency of the performance of the device on environmental factors such as temperature and humidity. And so that means whether you have a statistical distribution of possible failure thresholds of a device population. And so anytime you have a statistical distrib distribution, the supplier is also going to uh, build in some margin. And we'll we'll show you how that compares to uh, other other margins like operating margin uh, shortly. So there really aren't EOS failures. There's EOS damage, and uh, 
devices are not designed to be operated uh, in an out-of-spec operation. And so when we're looking for root causes and we're trying to solve a problem, it could confound the process if the system designer has violated the AMR. And um, we'll talk more about that. Next slide, please. Uh, one more question. Okay. Uh, let's see. A new one came in and threw me off. Hold on. <laughs> are, you, are you defining operating voltage of the component as AMR? No. We'll get to that in a second. That's a good, very good question. Okay. Okay. So here we, we're actually beginning to get to that. Uh, so the um, response of a device to some stress uh, is indicated here. So on the on the uh, x-axis, if you will, uh, we have increasing stress, and on the vertical or y-axis, we have the probability of damage. And region A is the safe handling application, where we have basically a robust situation. The device, we know the device is going to operate correctly according to the supplier's understanding of it. Uh, that the, the upper limit, stress limit of that region, is the maximum operating condition. So that says that outside that operating condition, the device is going to go into a situation where it may not function the way it's supposed to. It may not meet its other uh, data sheet parameters if you exceed that operating condition. However, uh, exceeding that does not necessarily uh, in the, uh, produce any permanent damage. And so there's actually an area between the maximum operating condition and the absolute maximum rating, which is region B, where there may be some restrictions on the usefulness of the device, but the device is probably not seeing any permanent damage. The absolute maximum rating is the area where the device begins to show some degradation. And the, the device uh, manufacturer knows this through extensive investigation of how the device would fail. And within that region, there's a region C uh, where there's a risk of latent damage, and then there's a region D which is uh, immediate failure. And that yellow line uh, curved the way it is reflects the statistical distribution that I talked about. So if I took a population of devices, they might come out anywhere on that curve in terms of their response to a damaging stress. Uh, we can break these things down further. Next slide. Uh, another question. Mm -hmm. uh, for those dealing with oxide breakdowns in devices, does the minimum voltage have to be supplied for electrical field breakdown um, to occur before current then flows and the damage and damages the device, then the current, whoops, it moved again on me. <clears throat> Where did it go? Before the current then flows and damages the device, the current is what actually damages the device. Yes, I agree with that. Right. So um, the, the, the field, high field itself, um, doesn't necessarily produce permanent damage. Of course, this, so here we're talking about a specific failure mode of a specific material more than anything else. But to get a, to get a permanent damage, there has to be some, some local heating. So there will, there will be current which flows. That's, that's, a, that's a good question, a correct interpretation, I think. Okay. So um, I've kind of already uh, jumped the gun and talked through those uh, boxes. Uh, so, yes? No, that's good. Okay. So, uh, so region A is kind of the, is the safe region uh, that we talked about before. Uh, go to the next slide. In region B, uh, the device <clears throat> may not function properly, and if you're going to routinely operate in this regime, you want to be in good communication with your uh, supplier uh, to understand what the implications of that are. Next slide. And then in Region C, uh, yes? No. Okay, sorry. I thought I heard something. 
so in, in Region C, again, is a, an area above the AMR. Uh, there will be some devices that have, may have a probability of failing immediately, although you'll see in the, that yellow line at the bottom, uh, it stays flat into the absolute, absolute maximum rating. Uh, sometimes when designers see this, they say this is a, they think this is additional margin that they can play with. Um, but this is not the case because you're already at high risk for some sort of latent damage. So the absolute maximum rating as defined by the supplier uh, should be adhered to um, without exception. Okay. Got a question, but no one can say that the device is not going through overstress in region B and have latent damage problems. Question. No one can say. Um, I guess I guess we would have to have a discussion about what you you mean by that. If you if you mean that there's a statistical probability that the tail of the failure distribution goes into region B, um, that's possible. Um, it also is probably uh, appropriate to say that the supplier cannot do an exhaustive um, simulation of everything a user might decide to do. And that's why if you are going to systematically be in Region B, you should be talking to the supplier about it. Okay, next slide. And region D is the immediate failure. Um, I'm going to uh, skip this slide. I think we've made most of these points already. So how do we detect an electrical overstress event? Uh, so um, as part of uh, putting together this white paper, uh, the uh, industry council took a survey, and they found that uh, most people classify an event as an electrical overstress, um, maybe not knowing exactly what that means through physical failure analysis. In other words, once that picture is developed, um, that's the conclusion. And in fact, the, the you know, going definition of EOS being uh, not, not the one we're using, but the old definition, which, which tends to lead you to just go immediately and go think of uh, unanticipated power applied to the device means you are at that point ruling out non-powered handling situations such as ESD. So that's a premature categorization of the failure. Uh, so uh, that's why we change terminology, but we also recognize that failure analysis houses need to have um, language which will allow them to tell you something useful. So uh, one thing we did was we created a new term, which is electrically induced physical damage, or EIPD. So this describes the physical damage of the physical of the physical signature. So uh, the FA house or FA organization should not tell you this looks like it's EOS. They should tell you this looks like it's electrically induced physical damage, as opposed to say uh, corrosion or mechanical damage. Okay, next slide, please. So here's the uh, definition. It's damage to an IC due to electrical thermal stress beyond the level which the materials could sustain. Uh, this would include melting of silicon, fusing of metal interconnects, and thermal damage of packaged material, fusing of bond wires, and so on. So at this point in the discussion, uh, again, just repeating myself a little bit, but this is an important point, is that we don't yet have information that can tell us if we have an electrical overstress. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some physical pictures of uh, physical damage. So if, if, when these, when the report comes back with these pictures, unless the, unless the a failure analysis engineer knows something else, he would just tell you that all of these things are electrically induced physical damage. He does not, by this information alone, know its root cause. Next slide. So, an electrical stress produces an EOS only when it exceeds a device failure threshold, um, uh, or the term we're really using for that is an absolute maximum rating. 
uh, EOS is not a property of a device, and uh, an EOS of a healthy device is somewhere in there. There's got to be a violation of a spec. If you have a failure of a device below its threshold, then that was a weak device, and that means the root causes need to be looked in a different direction. All right, next slide. So uh, you know, we we talked about in ESD we have uh, you know the HBM and CDM failure mechanisms that we can use to characterize and categorize uh, events. In EOS, it's much more complicated. You could look at stress types. You could go by failure signatures. You could go by root causes or failure mechanisms, and none of them quite do the job. Next slide, please. So uh, in the white paper, what you'll find there is a, a so-called fishbone diagram, uh, which describes, certainly in, not exhaustively, because there are many, many possible root causes of um, failures. And uh, they've been divided into three categories, powered handling, uh, switching, and unpowered handling. So we're going to blow up each of those uh, bubbles in the next slide next three slides actually. So powered handling uh, includes things like uh, misapplications in assembly and test. You, know, you, just, you just put the device in the wrong place. Uh, hot plugging is a big one. Uh, violation of specifications is a very general statement, but um, to cover a wide variety of uh, errors that are made. And uh, there may be external interference electromagnetic interference of some kind, which can, can cause failures as well. The next category is in the next slide. So this is uh, switching. So you can get, uh, during testing or during use, various fast voltage transients, uh, RF uh, power application, uh, surge currents due to things being broken, uh, contacts being broken and made somewhere else in the system and uh, noise uh, due to poor filtering. So that's, I mean, you could divide these things up in different ways, but this is just one way of, it has some logical sense to it in, 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 uh, in dividing them because you can begin to apply different ways of analyzing them if you make this high level distinction first. And the last uh, bubble from the root cause fishbone diagram is unpowered handling. And this is primarily uh, where we capture the ESD uh, aspect, charge people, charge board and devices, charge cables, uh, also things like unsuitable packaging uh, materials, other environmental factors. Okay, next slide. So when we're doing damage analysis, there's three questions we want to try to answer. What happened? So this is, this is uh, the external forensic part, if you will, uh, where you're trying to understand the situation. Um, when, you know, when did it happen? How many times did it happen? What were the environmental conditions? Uh, how it has happened uh, involves getting into understanding the path of the stress pulse. It's very important to analyze this. Some things um, uh, you know, won't make sense if you just look at how an electrical pulse could get from uh, the periphery of a device, for instance, to the point in the, in the core or the point on a circuit board where the failure occurs. This can help you narrow things down quite a bit. And then, uh, finally, you, of course, want to know why it happened, and you want to get an understanding of there's an external stress of some sort. Uh, what was it? Um, can I simulate it and see if I can reproduce the failure? And to do all of this, it, cause, it, it requires co close collaboration between IC supplier and customer. And I can say that if there's one thing that I learned in the uh, two or three years that I was involved in the discussions of producing this white paper was that this probably is one of the biggest problems. Um, you know, we have a tendency to point fingers and look for the failure on the other side of the corporate boundary if we can, um, and that just leads to all kinds of dysfunctional uh, discussions and going down paths that are not fruitful. So the extent to which finding out the what, how, and why is done in a collaboration between supplier and customer 
uh, you'll get a more fruitful result. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a, a quick uh, case history of hot plugging. Um, two locations were getting different results. Uh, the physical failure mode was was uh, seen, like in the chart here, and in fact, they figured out that it involved a, uh, actually an ESD protection network failing uh, on a, a LIN uh, interface device. Next slide, please. And uh, so uh, the analysis began. They started looking at what, how could you make this type of failure occur uh, by applying some positive and negative voltage pulses exploring some of the types of things that could happen. Clearly, the device supplier has to be talking to the customer about what are reasonable pulses that might be occurring in the system. And they found that they could damage this device uh, with a positive voltage pulse from a 20 uh, microfarad uh, charge capacitor beyond a certain voltage. And this exceeded the AMR, which was known to be 36 volts. Next slide, please. So then this meant going back and looking at what was happening at the two locations, A and B. And sure enough, it found out that the location A, where the failures were occurring, uh, this operation of inserting this part into the system was being done powered. It was actually power on the uh, side, of the insertion side. And so once this was changed, the failure went away. And by the way, hot plugging. Uh, and proper sequencing um, is a huge cause of, uh, you know, ex exceeding of AMRs and the causing of electrical overstress damage. Next slide, please. So um, I've sort of already covered this. That you know, ultimately they found that the uh, damage was being caused at uh, hot plugging. In fact, um, the a connector design was such that this was possible. You could actually engage some pins before others in a way that was damaging to the circuit. So that's another aspect to prevention. Uh, next slide. So uh, customer and supplier need to provide good information. Uh, and the customer knows how they handle the device. Uh, they know the schematics of the board or assembly. They know about the power sequencing that they've been doing, and uh, they know a lot about their functional system. The supplier needs to provide good uh, data sheet and operational limits, um, details about the design, and the package layout and connections. More stuff probably was ne is needed, but this is just a short list to give you an example. Uh, next slide. So. Uh, this just returns us back to the fact that um, EOS is a root is a uh, result. ESD, for instance, is a root cause. All of the other things that we just talked about, hot plugging, uh, and all those uh, spines on the fishbone diagram, are each like ESD in the sense that they are a separate root cause that has its own set of considerations. Uh, also, just some important points here that are not fully appreciated in the industry. And this was verified in this in these surveys and the study that was done. There is no correlation of EOS return rates and the ESD sensitivity of devices. And uh, this is often mistaken. Quite often, a customer may target um, the HBM sensitivities of a device as something to consider, um, but this is all almost always. In fact, in every case I know of, it's a it's a um, it's a uh, a rat hole that put a lot of resources into without any results. Okay, next slide. Now, it's a little bit about um, uh, ESD induced uh, electrical overstress, uh, and this is really, we're talking about charge boards and charge cables. This is an unappreciated aspect of manufacturing assembly uh, that often gets ignored because uh, people are doing the thing that we talked about early in this presentation, which was look at the picture and decide the root cause and then go try to prove it. 
it turns out that if you have uh, an ESD event involving a board or a cable, uh, this generates uh, physical failure signatures that look like um, or generates electrically induced physical damage, to use the term that I'm trying to promote here, um, that people would previously have interpreted as being caused by some over voltage or overcurrent due to the connection of the device to power. Uh, next slide, please. So boards, uh, in particular, can be charged. Uh, there's, some, it's, you know, some people even believe that the devices on the board are safe uh, once they're on the board, and this is certainly not the case. Um, they may be statistically, individually, uh, less likely to see a failure, but a board itself is vulnerable to failure at the same rate as any other device. And it's just a matter of how it's handled. Here we have some boards sitting on a, a, vis a visual inspection station uh, on an insulator. Uh, those are, are ripe for a charge, so-called charge board event. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also have uh, charging of boards along conveyors. And then when they go into something like is shown here, a wave soldering machine, the first touch of the connector end of the board here to the wave is a charge board event. Uh, the device in the picture here is an ESD event detector that was recording the events as they were occurring. Um, the physical failure signature or the electrically induced physical damage here is quite extensive for this type of, of uh, event. Next slide. Uh, you can have, in some cases, this is not recommended practice, certainly by us. Uh, to put boards on a metal cart. Uh, the metal cart acts like ground. If the board is charged at all, you'll get a discharge from the board to the cart or vice versa. And uh, this triggers a charge board event. Next slide. Uh, here we have a plexiglass cover on a board, uh, which can carry a electrostatic charge. When this board is plugged into a test set, which is what it was intended for here, uh, some of these boards were failing just due to this electrostatic charge. Again, this is a, a lot of charge produces a large EIPD. Next. Uh, testing has been done to show that uh, this can indeed happen by repurposing a uh, charge device model simulator uh, to test boards. Uh, uh, this is work that was done by our friends at Analog Devices. And uh, you can see there's a sensitive pin that was known to be failing in the customer uh, assembly operation. And uh, so a, a test was done uh, to see if they could reproduce it. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is the ugly uh, uh, discharge and ugly um, uh, physical damage that was produced by this. And uh, this, this type of experience led uh, analog devices to uh, suggest that about 50% of their failures that were being categorized as EOS in the old definition of EOS were in fact due to these types of failures. Uh, one big category is this charge board event. Uh, the other is charge cables, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just looking at the uh, peak currents that occur here. And the, the, the a main takeaway for this stress is that the because the device was sitting on the board and there was more charge available on the board, a higher current flowed through the device at a voltage actually uh, lower than what was known to be the voltage threshold. So uh, you can fool yourself into thinking you're keeping the voltages low enough to protect the device uh, if you have situations where it's a charge board event, not a charge device uh, failure. OK, next slide. Uh, the charge board event is very widely varied, as you might suspect. So these are some simulations of how different types of uh, inductance, capacitance, and resistance in the discharge path. They won't all look like the the physical damage that I showed you above, uh, but you could get, still get subtle failures, um, uh, which are not due to the application of power, 
but are due to an electrostatic discharge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I am not going to have time, I don't think, to go through this whole uh, scenario. So let me give you the uh, short uh, version. Uh, this is an example, a case history that we encountered where uh, the CMOS device uh, uh, indicate Ted, I don't know if you can maybe help me with the cursor there a little bit and show. So that yeah, this, the CMOS device right there suddenly started failing. And if you, if you look at the actual photograph on the right, you can see the device. And you can also see uh, on edge there a white region, which is actually a plastic faceplate uh, of this part. Uh, this device had no failures for years. Uh, when the faceplate material was changed, uh, it tended to charge to a much higher level and actually was producing failures in in-circuit test. Uh, this is what we call a field-induced uh, charge board failure. Uh, this was many years ago, actually, before people actually knew how prevalent charge board failures were. Um, and you can see this was quite a robust device. Um, its CDM threshold was considered was, was plenty high. Uh, so uh, the presence of insulators on boards is something to be considered in uh, having a, an, a ESD safe process to avoid ESD induced electrical overstress damage. Next slide, please. Uh, cables uh, can do a similar thing. In this case, instead of the board being charged by motion on a conveyor or something of that sort, you can charge the cable insulation just by handling. And this induces a voltage on the conductors of the cable. And when you plug the cable into equipment like shown here, uh, you can either cause upset, upset the operating equipment um, or you can cause actually uh, electrical damage because the current which flows uh, exceeds some AMR of a device uh, inside the equipment. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an example of doing a CDE or charge uh, cable discharge event and it produces a uh, waveform uh, that actually looks like a, an ESD that you might see from a charge device model situation with some more energy in it because all of the uh, charge which is induced on the cable produces a much higher current than you would get uh, otherwise at the same voltage. Next slide, please. Uh, this can happen in uh, manufacturing. Uh, here we have some cables which are not ESD sensitive, so they come to the manufacturing floor in static generating plastic like this. And uh, in this particular case, next slide please, these cables were uh, by their very design inserted into a radio uh, right uh, at the terminals of very, very sensitive RF devices and were causing failures because the cable uh, material was being charged. Again, this was a mystery for a long time. Uh, the customers had difficulty uh, finding it until we started looking at this as an ESD problem, not a, a power problem in, in tests, for instance. So here we go back to the Pareto analysis we looked at before. Uh, if we take into account the information we've just seen about charge board events and cable discharge, uh, this chart will change a little bit. Uh, Ted, can you advance it? So. Uh, there's a good, uh, I think you, well, this is fine. If you, if you begin to include the uh, ESD events uh, in as a root cause, and the EOS here means other root causes which ultimately result in EOS, then they become comparable. Um, it's an it's a educated guess at this point. Uh, but the main, the main point here is that if you're getting the message from your failure analysis house that something is an, is a electrical overstress and, they mean, and, and what they mean by that is applied voltage or current, um, don't take that as necessarily true. You may have, of course, sources of, of electrostatic voltages which are causing the problem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
of course, we can't ignore all of these sources from power, and I'm not going to go through this uh, whole list, but there are things here that um, one begins to look for uh, if they're going to be doing troubleshooting for finding uh, sources of EOS damage. So ground loops, uh, bad wiring, uh, voltages from tools, uh, soldering irons and power tools are a big possible source, using the wrong power adapters, and as I said before, just things that are really not rocket science, hot plug-in and uh, faulty power sequencing are often the culprits. And of course, wire bonding uh, done improperly can be a source of considerable damage. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just another way of categorizing. You could categorize by signal type. This would maybe move you towards trying to develop an HBM or a CDM-like uh, model uh, for some of these things. But um, what usually happens is that uh, if affairs of a certain type are happening a lot, a device supplier or a customer will begin to de develop their own in-house stress test to look at vulnerability to a stress that they know happens a lot. But they tend to be proprietary um, and very specific to a given application and device type. Next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned uh, the soldering irons. Um, don't need to go into that much more. I think it's well known that these can be sources of unexpected uh, voltage. Next slide, please. Uh, there are uh, no manufacturing EOS control requirements in the industry. Uh, there is a statement in IPC 610, which is the workmanship standard for printed wiring assemblies, and it has this is word for word out of the document. And it talks about uh, preventing spikes greater than 0.3 volt. It doesn't say how you make this measurement. Um, so really this is fertile ground for uh, providing more information to the industry about mitigating the appearance of electrical overstress uh, damage in manufacturing environments. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, there are a lot of places where uh, faulty grounding can be a cause. Uh, this uh, is one of our own case histories where uh, we actually found poor uh, bonding, uh, grounding rather, at wire bonding by using event detection. And event detection is a great tool for this type of surveillance. It's, uh, we could talk about that in another whole uh, webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, here, we, here's the corrective action for that case uh, where once the grounding was, was improved, the events captured by the event detector went away. Next. Uh, you can have uh, electrofast transients on a power line. Uh, so the source can be in one piece of equipment and you'll have another piece of equipment handling devices that sees a conductive electrical fast transient and this can damage a, uh, a part. There are many scenarios uh, like this. This one's taken from a paper by uh, Vladimir Kras and Al Wallish back in 2010 at the ESD Symposium. So uh, the last uh, message that I just want to leave with about manufacturing is that uh, it, uh, there's a group working to try to pull together information about EOS mitigation in manufacturing and develop or, or um, publish uh, best practices. Uh, we don't have a formal EOS prevention system, you know, for things other than ESD. Uh, you know, often uh, the failures occur due to lack of awareness. You know, the hot plugging thing, for instance, is often an awareness issue. And uh, when failures occur, you know, there are many stakeholders, and um, you know, it makes you know after the fact root cause analysis difficult. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we'd like to propose that an organization could have an EOS control problem uh, program, if you will, that would look at the causes of the types of things that we just discussed and make sure the 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 possibility of those happening is reduced through 
uh, the same types of things that we do for an ESD program, make the appropriate measurements, do the appropriate surveillance, make corrective action on the process rather than trying to make corrective action when you have device failures. And next slide, please. Uh, there are people in the industry doing this who have uh, audit checklists, what they call an EOS audit checklist that looks at cables, looks at power, uh, looks at whether the right adapters are using, monitors, so hot swapping, this sort of thing. Uh, this is from an actual uh, company website where they've talked about their particular audit checklist. Uh, next slide, please. And they have uh, you know, mitigation things that they work on. Uh, when they introduce a new design, is there hot swapping going on and is it necessary and how do you audit it? Uh, is the sequencing right and have you, uh, for instance, ensured that the software meets the appropriate, that the test software meets the appropriate uh, power sequence requirements? Again, are there right adapters uh, being used? And uh, we had a case where in the whole factory, um, the adapters used for one operation were uh, the wrong voltage, and uh, but that can be a subtle thing. It's not. It's, it's something so simple that nobody looks for. Uh, so uh, you know the the phrase at the bottom there is do not assume these things are being done. Uh, they're most likely not, and unfortunately the only way we catch problems uh, these days with um, with uh, sources of EOS is when devices start to fail. So we'd like to get ahead of that problem and be looking for the right things in the factory processes. Uh, I think that's the last slide. And uh, I have a little bit of time for, for any questions. Well, I have a couple more. OK. Uh, one of them is, do we need to use an ionizer when connecting cables to a circuit board? Well, the use of ionizers is um, you know, always a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we like to say, you know, make measurements and see what's actually happening. But um, I'd say when in doubt, uh, you know, probably. Uh, Ted, do you want to add anything to that since that's ESD control? I'm sorry, I was reading the questions. Um, okay. I was just, I was just, you know, the question was, should we use an ionizer when you're plugging cable into a board? And, you know, it's application dependent, obviously. Um, so, uh, I think generally sense. grounding the cable is more reliable. Grounding True. one while you're yeah, connected yeah. to the board is yeah. more effective than ionization. Cause it yeah, can so I think the, pr the problem may come into whether you've got the board properly grounded. That too, yeah. 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 Let's see, this question, I don't quite, there's a typo in it. Uh, what went wrong? What do you do? Redesign or something else? I'm not sure which slide that appeared to. Well, that was the slide with um, the how, what, and why, okay. I think, probably. Um, it is, slide 33. So every case, every case is different, right? Um, often, if if you can't establish that the AMR has been exceeded, then the best thing to do is make a change in the process or the design so that that's not happening. And in many, many of the case histories that you know we've seen, that is ultimately the resolution. You know, there's something happening that's you know getting the voltage up higher than some level. And uh, that is what needs to be fixed. Redesigns are very expensive. Um, you sort of would need to do a redesign in the case where, in fact, the AMR was not exceeded, and you find that the devices don't meet their own 
published AMR. So in a case like that, you either change the AMR, um, which doesn't necessarily solve the problem at hand, um, or you, you actually redesign the device. is very closely related. If you establish damage is created by CBE or CDE, uh, what else do, do you do? Redesign or something else? Okay, yes, yeah, similar question. So in that case, the simpler solution is to fix what's happening in the manufacturing process, which is charging the board or charging the cable. And these things are almost always fixable. The, the, the big problem with that uh, category of root causes is so many, so few people are aware of it. But once you know you're charging a cable, you can avoid it. Okay. That covers, I believe that covers all the questions. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you, Terry. And you're welcome. everybody for joining us. Uh, okay. Well done, as usual. And uh, again, the, this uh, webinar in its entirety will be posted on our website about a week from now. And uh, Ted, do, do, do they have a way of, you know, questions may come up later that they want to... Yeah, feel free ask. to um, send us questions if you want to, if something comes up later that you haven't thought of. You can send it either to me or to Terry. And our emails, let's see. I don't think they're in there. No, it's, um, the format is our first name at danglemeyer.com. So it would be ted at danglemeyer.com or terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at danglemeyer.com. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Bye now. Bye. -bye.